Let's mention a little bit about ventilation control. Again, when you talk about ventilation, you talk about moving air in and out of your lungs. You're talking about controlling these muscles like that diaphragm muscle, intercostals, and others we mentioned in other videos. But when you look at how this is working, what's controlling them, you've obviously got some groups of neurons in the nervous system doing this. We can go right back to the medulla oblongata and the pons. Back in the brain chapter, you should have seen somewhere that when you look at that brain stem, here's where you have groups of neurons that control vital functions. And your breathing, your ventilation is definitely one of them right there. So when you look in that medulla oblongata, they mention their dorsal and ventral groups right here, stimulating these different muscles. And of course, those are very important when it comes to ventilation. And over here in the pons, another part, you've got the neurons, which are more important about swapping between inspiration and expiration. Again, to some degree, you can control this movement of air with your conscious thought, but only so much. This is mostly autonomic. So luckily, we've got these neurons controlling this for us. When you talk about apnea, you're talking about losing your breathing. It stopped for whatever reason, and many things could cause this here. Well, first of all, it might be a conscious decision. You can hold your breath, but of course, only for so long. And then eventually, you're going to have to breathe again, whether you like it or not. And the reason for that is, it's not really because the oxygen levels are dropping. Now, they are, but it's not really the drop in oxygen that causes you to breathe again. It's that rise in CO2. Remember when carbon dioxide levels go up, hydrogen goes up and somebody quickly starts to get acidosis. The body is more worried about the CO2 and hydrogen levels than it is oxygen. That's probably something you heard wrong throughout your life there. Hyperventilation is where somebody's breathing too fast. Now think about what would be wrong with breathing too rapidly. If somebody's breathing really fast. They're going to be taking in more oxygen. But at the same time, they're going to be releasing too much carbon dioxide. And if you let those CO2 levels get too low, hydrogen levels get too low. And that's alkalosis right there. Again, the body does not tolerate acidosis or alkalosis very much at all. So here's what will happen when somebody hyperventilates. When those CO2 levels get too low, hydrogen levels get too low. Well, the body needs more CO2 and hydrogen back in that blood and those tissues. So what it'll do is dilate every blood vessel in the body. When it dilates all these peripheral blood vessels, that picks up more carbon dioxide and that gives more hydrogen. Remember, those two things always go hand in hand. Well, yeah, that'll help with the CO2 and the hydrogen balance. But remember, when you dilate many blood vessels, blood pressure drops, and that's why somebody might possibly faint if they hyperventilate. You look at the cerebral, cerebrum, and limbic systems, definitely help you to control the muscles of ventilation. Those have been discussed back in previous chapters there. Strong emotions tend to cause us to breathe faster and deeper. You can also look at this chemical control. Again, you look at the chemicals, brain really likes to watch that pH, that's the CO2 and the hydrogen going hand in hand, and then the oxygen is a distant second right there. So since carbon dioxide goes hand in hand with that hydrogen, it's the major regulator of your pH. That's why respiratory system is your number one pH balancing system. Again, anytime CO2 goes up, hydrogen, hydrogen goes up. Somebody gets acidosis. CO2 goes down, hydrogen levels get too low, and they get alkalosis right there. So we got chemical regulators always monitoring these chemicals here. When you look at changes in oxygen in the blood, you've got to see a drop in blood oxygen levels by 50% before the brain even starts to care and changes your ventilation rate. So again, tiny changes in CO2 will rapidly change your breathing. It takes a big change in oxygen for that to happen there. And down here at the bottom, hypercapnia is just too much CO2 in your blood and body. Hypocapnia is just the opposite. But let's mention a little about these chemoreceptors. Chemicals monitoring very, excuse me, chemical receptors monitoring very important chemicals like CO2 and oxygen. So when you look at some of these like the central chemoreceptors, those are found in that medulla oblongata. Look at these peripheral, right? We're out in the periphery of the body, away from the central nervous system. You put them in places like the internal carotids and the aorta. Well, think about why the brain would be monitoring chemicals like CO2 and oxygen in these areas. 
you better keep enough of those gases, should say a proper balance of those gases to that medulla oblongata, because if you don't get the proper balance of them there, neurons in the medulla could die quickly. And then you're dead and you're not ever coming back. But you can also monitor CO2 in oxygen places like the internal carotids because the internal carotids are the two biggest inflows of blood to your brain. So you better keep enough oxygen going to the brain and also not let it get acidic or you can be dead quickly. And the aorta is the very first artery out of the left side of the heart that feeds blood to all the other arteries except the pulmonary. So when you monitor those chemicals at the aorta, you're monitoring them basically in many parts of the body at the same time. And again, we've talked about the effects of pH. Remember, low pH numbers are acids. High pH numbers are bases. You don't see a lot of people having a lot of trouble with alkaline blood. It's usually when it gets acidic. And of course, that affects the rest of the body right there. CO2 and hydrogen go hand in hand. When you balance one of those, you balance the other. Again, that's why respiratory systems are number one pH balancing system. So look at the effects of carbon dioxide. Tiny changes in CO2 rapidly change the hydrogen levels. Again, you got to have big changes in oxygen before that happens there. So there's our hyper and hypocapnia. Again, you look at chemosensitive areas, the brain stem with that medulla oblongata is a very big one. And also monitor that blood and look at those uh, gases in the internal carotids going in the brain. And of course, in that aorta going out to the rest of the body. Very good places to monitor those gases at. So look at the effects of oxygen once more. Again, you can have a big change in oxygen where you see any change in how fast you're breathing. But tiny changes in CO2 will give you rapid changes in how fast and deep you're breathing there. And there at the bottom, you see the term hypoxia. Here's where somebody doesn't have enough oxygen in the blood. It would definitely cause them to breathe faster but balancing the CO2 always comes first. The Herring-Brower reflex is something that keeps us from overinflating our lungs. Look at those alveoli, they got microscopic thin walls. If you were to overinflate them, you might rupture and damage that respiratory membrane. You don't want that. So the lungs are another place where we have baroreceptors. Remember, you can think of those as stretch or pressure receptors. They can detect how much you have filled the lungs with air, keeps them from overinflating. That way you don't damage that alveolar wall. That would cause a loss in membrane, respiratory membrane, which would cause a loss in gas exchange, which you never want. And of course, when we're exercising is when this really works to keep us from overinflating the lungs. So there's our pictures and our links as well.